Okay, so hello everyone, my name is Daria and today I want to talk about functional programming and the usage of functional programming in modern JavaScript applications. I would say that this lecture more of a beginner type, so we will not cover really complex stuff around functional programming because there are some, but we will cover the basics and how we can use them uh, right away in our application. So functional programming, I've I'm sure everybody at least ha have heard about it. And no wonder, because we can observe a growing popularity of this subject. Um, but there is a common belief that the functional programming is really hard and there are a lot of academic terms. And when you start Googling, you're just losing your mind and it seems too complicated to handle it. But Basically, the concepts of functional programming are not as complicated as they seem, and today we will try to understand them better. So I would say my main goal for this lecture is to remove your fear of functional programming. Okay, uh, what is we will going to cover today? First of all, we will cover what exactly functional programming mean, me, means. We will cover the common myths around functional programming. I will show you the basic patterns and some examples. Also, we will talk about a little bit about functional programming with usage in React. And of course, we will talk about why functional programming is good, why it is bad, and for sure we will cover the main battle between object-oriented programming and functional programming. So, okay, let's start. Uh, well, code written in functional declarative way is more concise, more predictable than imperative code. Just in case, the main difference between imperative code and declarative code is that in imperative code, we write how to do it. And in declarative code, we write what we need to do. In fact, if you worked with JavaScript, you probably already know and even used certain com concepts from the functional programming world. Um, functional programming, firstly, is a programming style, not it's not tied to any language at all. So you can use the principles in any language, basically. Of course, there are languages that are like tied to functional programming style like Haskell and Lisp, but we will not talk about them today. Unlike the popular object-oriented programming, uh, functional programming is based on function and their composition, not on classes. Uh, Object-oriented programming concepts uh, imply complex relationships between these structures, while the functional approach tends to keep, sim to keep things as simple as possible and use only function. Well, functional programming is a whole new way at look of looking into programming. If you come from the object-oriented programming world, it will turn your world upside down because what you thought were bad ideas turned out to be actually good ideas. What you thought was convenient and clever turned out to be problematic or sometimes even impossible. So functional programming has gained popularity in recent years, but it is also surrounded by several myths that may mislead people about its capabilities and limitations. Uh, let's, let's take a look at some common myths about functional programming. First of all, functional programming is difficult. Uh, well, uh, functional programming has a different way of thinking than other paradigms, so it may take some time to get used to it. However, once you understand the fundamental concepts of functional programming, you, it can be just easy to write functional code as it is to write an imperative code. In fact, many developers find, find functional programming to be simpler and more elegant than other paradigms. The next myth is that functional programming is only for the for mathematical application. Functional programming is always is often associated with mathematical application, but it is not limited to them. It can be used in a wide range of application, including web development, data processing, game development, and any other stuff. Functional programming is especially useful for applications that require hard concurrency or parallelism, but I would say that it's not regarding JavaScript. Um, next myth is that functional programming is slow. Um, well, some people believe that functional programmer can be slower than other paradigms. Um, however, it is not necessarily true. While functional programmers may be slower in certain cases, and I think we will cover that a little bit later, it can also be faster in other cases. Functional programming emphasizes immutability, which can improve performance, actually. Uh, 
next myth is that functional programming is only for experts. This, I would say, this, this is the most common myth. Functional programming may seem intimidating at first, but it is accessible for programmers at all skill levels. Um, many programmer languages offer functional features, such as harder functions, uh, that can be used by any programmers. Um, additionally, there are many online resources available for learning functional programming. Um, functional programming is incompatible with object-oriented programmer programming. Um, they are often presented as opposing paradigms. Yeah, it's true. Uh, however, they can be used together in a complementary way uh, once you understand the basic concept, concepts of both paradigms. Uh, in summary, function, functional programming has many advantages and it's not limited to mathematical applications or, uh, or experts. It can be combined with our other paradigms. It's not a problem and we will also talk about it a little bit later. So, okay, we've covered like the most common myths regarding um, functional programming and let's dive into a little bit of patterns. So the first pattern is for sure pure functions. Pure function is this, the main, uh, the most important stuff that is happening in functional programming. So what does make function pure? Uh, well, first of all, um, the function should always return the same output given the same input. This means also that the function should be deterministic and do not depend on any external state or any hidden dependencies. A pure function should not modify it in external states or have any side effects. That includes modifying global variables, modifying objects that was passed in, or like performing input output operation or um, like, write, like writing files to the disk or sending API requests. A pure function should not rely on any mutable state or external dependencies. Uh, this includes relying on the value of a time step or a mass random, for example. A pure function should be a dempotent, meaning that the calling function multiple times with the same input arguments should produce the same result as it, it was calling only once. By following these rules, pure functions can help code easier to reason about, test, and maintain. Since pure functions do not have any side effects or rely on external state, they can be tested in isolation without worrying about the state of the program. In addition, pure functions are often easier to compose and reuse since they do not have any external dependencies. Okay, let's take a look at some examples here. So we will try to make function pure. Uh, let's take a look at the first function. We see that we have function that formats our date. Well, basically this function will work, but it is not a pure function. Uh, what can we do to make this function actually pure? Um, basically, we shouldn't use any external stuff. Here we're using the date object that we're executing. So this anytime this function will be executed, this stuff will be changed. And the result of the function called in different times will be different. And it violates the rule of the pure function. So what we can do, we can receive the date as an input argument. And right now, if we will do like this, this will be this will be a pure function because the result will always be the same based on the input arguments. So this small trick will help you like to test it and so on and so forth. Let's take a look at this second example. Let's imagine that we have some user object and we want to enhance it with ID, for example, or any other properties. So we're taking this object as an input and we're adding the, some ID property and we're returning that object. What is problematic here is that our object is being modified. So if we're try something like this, enhanced, enhanced with ID, and we will pass the user, the updated user will be the object with three values. But the problem is that the user will be also an object with three values. Let's quickly check that out. Okay. Oh, 
sorry. Yeah, we may take a look that we received two exactly the same console logs. So we're messing up with the global state here. So we're changing not the updated user, like we're not only considering this a changed user, but the initial object also get changed here. So what we can do, let's try to make this function your we also receive an object, but instead of modifying this object, we're returning the copy of that object and we're adding ID here. So if we try to call a, this with user object, the user object right now should be the same as it was before and the updated user should be with ID. Let's take a look. Yeah, basically we're we were right, the user object remains the same, but the updated user got new properties. Okay, let's take a look at the third example. So let's imagine that we need to create some function that calculates total price. So we're passing inside product price, and here we have some calculation based on tax percent. Um, and what is wrong here? we're also messing up with external state. So the tax percent value isn't used only in that function. So this is gonna be an easy one. So how do we make this function pure? Let's try. We're receiving product price. And we're also receiving tax here. So basically the tax percent should be an, an argument and we can do something like this. So. And the function remains the same here. So basically we made that function pure and it's not violates right now the rules of the pure function. Okay, so um, I've mentioned that pure function should not uh, have any side effects. And here you can see the list of the most common side effects in JavaScript. Um, I think you have a question like, but I need to do console lock. I need to make some interaction with local storage. And I would say in modern world, you probably will have to do it <laughs> and you will have, it will not be functional, but but it's okay. I wouldn't say that I, I don't propose you to use only functional approach to write code, especially the UI code because the UI code is pretty much imp uh, imperative. So you should just know that if you have this stuff inside your function, your function is not pure. And probably if you have something like this, it will be really hard to test it and maintain because there might be issues. Okay, um, the next concept of functional programming is functional composition. Um, I think you've probably heard it from school or university. Well, basically it's a process of combining two or more function to produce a new function. The output of one function is passed as input to a, another function and so on. Uh, in JavaScript, this is usually accomplished by using the composed or pipe functions. And we will take a look at uh, how, how we can implement them right away. So, okay. Um, Let's give an example of like simple function composition. So for example, we have a function square that takes argument and do something like this. Okay, pretty simple. And we have function add to that also takes input argument and just adds some value to it. Okay, so let's Execute it in that way. So we have result one, and it's going to be square add two, and the initial value is two here, and result two is going to be vice versa add two square two. So basically, we have different results. And what is the main difference is the order of execution. So here is the example of the simplest function composition because you know we're executing at two and the result of that function is passed as an input to another function and we may have a really long chain of that functions but well we will receive different 
uh, answer. So firstly, here we're just adding two. So your got is going to be four and we're squaring it. So it's going to be 16. And here we're passing two into square function. And only after that, we're adding two and it's going to be six. Um, basically, this is, as I've said, the, the main example uh, of let's let's make sure that we're not messing anything. Yeah, 16 and 6. Um, but this is, it looks okay, but what if we have a lot of functions? Like we have a lot of chain of functions. We should create something like a compose function. So it's it's really easy to create this kind of function. So the compose function will take some number of functions as an input. So it may be any number. And after that, it returns also a function with some initial value. And it, we're putting the functions in array. Uh, important thing here, we're reversing that array. I will talk about this in a moment. Why do we need it? And after that, we're calling this function one by one with the accumulated value starting was input value starting with x. So basically, right now, this compose functions may support a lot of functions, uh, and it's going to be convenient to you. So let's check that. Let's create composed function, for, first of all. So we're composing square and add to. And let's. Oh, sorry. Um, and we're execute this composed function on two. Okay, so what the results gonna look like? Or will it be 16 or six? So that is basically the reason why we made the reverse. Because if you see here, the first function to execute is the rightest one. So the add to execu is executed first, and only after that, the square function is executed. Basically, we're following the same approach here. So the add to function will be executed at first, and only after that will be executed the square function. So the result should be 16. Let's take a look. Yeah, the result is 16 here. So if we change the order here, the result will be changed. But maybe you're, it's not convenient to use, like to know that the second, the, the last argument will be executed, the last function will be executed first. We want to like first execute square and only after that execute at two. It's not a problem here comes pipe function. Basically pipe function is really similar to compose function. I will copy that actually. And the only thing difference here is this reverse statement. So basically, if we're creating piped function here with the same arguments, and we're creating another result, we still Basically, here should be a square function executed first and add to executed second. Let's let's check that out. Yeah, so basically the result is six, and this should be what should be happening. So you may compose a lot of function. I've just Give, given you the simplest example. It's really convenient if you have a lot of function, if you have some, I don't know, validation stuff going on or something else, uh, you should really consider using this com composing fun pipe function. Uh, and it's up to you to decide whether you want to use pipe or compose because they are not uh, really much that different. Okay, um, the next stuff that is going on in functional programming is mutability. Um, basically, mutability provide like tells us that we should use only const, we shouldn't use let or var, and we should only copy the data. We should not override it. Um, what does it give us? Uh, first of all, it gives us predictable state management, immutable data structure, provide a clear and predictable way to manage state. Uh, when a value cannot be changed, it eliminates the possibility of unexpected changes to the data. 
Um, it's going to provide you easier debugging as well, because immutable st structures cannot be modified. It can be easier to debug code that uses them. Um, bugs related to unexpected changes of data are likely less to occur. Um, well, but we have a problem here. Uh, I'm sure you may probably know what I'm, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, in JavaScript, uh, if we would create some simple constant, like it can be number, string, boolean, whatever, not complex. And if we're, we will try to override that, um, what will happen? Let's take a look. Yeah, we may see that we're receiving a type error assignments to constant variables. So we're actually fine here, we're safe. JavaScript will not allow us to override the constant. But what if we're talking about some complex variables like user, let's create some user object. And yeah, okay, if we will do something like this, we will also receive an error. Yeah, uh, assigning to constant variable. But if we will do something like this, Out. Yeah, we do not receive any errors. So basically, we cannot achieve with JavaScript functionality the full immutability here. So we, we cannot be really safe with objects uh, or uh, arrays or any other complex data structures. So if we want to achieve immutability, what should we do? Unfortunately, we cannot do it without any other external libraries. Um, well, I would suggest you take a look at Immutable.js or Emerge.js. They're providing uh, some immutable data structure that will throw errors. Uh, and actually, Immutable.js, if I'm not wrong, is used under the hood of Redux Toolkit library. If you know uh, that in Redux Toolkit, you actually can modify the state inside of the reducer. And basically, it's due to immutable JS because under the hood, it makes this uh, this like push, st push statement or something like that immutable. Okay, let's move on. The next, uh, what we're going to talk about is recursion. So recursion is a technique uh, where a function calls itself either directly or indirectly to solve a problem. It is a powerful tool for solving problems that have a recursive structure. Usually it's something like tree structures. Um, it may also be used in some sorting or searching algorithms or mathematical operation. As you may know, like the most common example of recursion is calculating factorial. Um, to write a function, to write a recursive function, you need to follow the rule that you need to have a base case of the recursive function and the recursive case. Um, and like, this is the most important stuff here because you should be extremely careful with recursion because recursion um, may have some problems with optimization, but um, if you, so you should like, you should be sure that the base condition will be met at some point of time. And, uh, Actually, if you have some other um, ways of solving the problem without recursion, you should also consider it. But there are some cases where recursion like really saves your life. Um, let's take a look at some example. I will not provide you an example of uh, like factorial, but let's imagine that we have some tasks array and that tasks array, any task may have subtask and any subtask also may have subtasks and so on and so forth. So um, let's imagine that we need to write a function like um, at depths, for example. We need to have depths in each level of nesting. <clears throat> With this kind of structure, the recursion will save our life. So what should we, should we do? We receive some array. Okay, let's imagine that we do not need to worry about um, the nesting inside. So what we will do, we will just make the map function with this item and we will return that item, provide depths, something like this. Okay, it will work for the first level, but we also need to do that kind of stuff inside every subtask array. So what should we do? We're, we will overwrite subtasks here. So basically here comes our base case and recursive case. So we need to check whether 
the item has these subtasks. So we're making something like that item subtasks. If we have that kind of array, then we're executing this at depth function with item subtasks. If not, we're just returning undefined. So currently the function will work, but it will always return the depth zero. So how can we make the depths also flexible argument? We can provide it as an input argument here. So by default, the depth is gonna be zero. And on the first go, it will always return zero. But here in every going on, going inside the item subtasks, we will be adding plus one. So basically, this is the example of a really simple, but I would say real world or recursive function. Let's take a look at our result. Yeah, we may see that here we have the depth zero. Oh, sorry, yeah, we need to, let's make it like this. Yeah, and we may see that here we have subtasks with depth one and then with depth two inside and here depth one and depth zero. So actually our function works. Um, okay, let's move on. <clears throat> higher order function. Uh, higher order functions in JavaScript are functions that can take one or more functions as arguments and or return a function as its result. Um, in other words, they are functions that operates on other functions either by accepting them or returning them as values or both. Higher order function enable powerful functional programming techniques, uh, patterns like function composition, carrying, and some others. Um, basically, I would say that this is one of the easiest uh, concept of functional programming because if you use JavaScript, you've probably used it a lot. Here on the screen, you can see the example of higher order function in JavaScript. So basically, um, you may never thought, but yeah, this functions, yeah, received the function as their input argument and returns uh, some result based on that. So uh, you may create like any other higher order function uh, and it's going to make your life easier, I would say. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, the next technique that we're going to talk about is currying. Um, currying is a function of programming techniques that involves transforming function that takes multiple arguments into a sequence of function uh, that each takes one argument per time. And uh, this is gonna be called when the series was our, of arguments until all the initial arguments are provided. Um, let's take a look at the example. So let's imagine we have this multiply function. Uh, so it's like these one pretty straightforward. So we can create our multiply function and it's going to look like this. So it's going to be a sequence of functions that's going to be executed like this. So the result one is going to be two, three, four. Uh, so what does it gives us? Why do we need it? So basically, we may call this function partially. So we may call this like, like this and call somewhere else with our other arguments. Um, and, and I would say that it looks pretty cool, to be honest. So we can create a simple curry function. Um, the easiest implementation of curry function looks like this. So we're returning the function a, b, um, and we're returning with the a, b, but it's tied to the number of arguments. So a little more, the implementation of curry function that accepts like a lot of arguments, the any number is a little bit complex. Uh, so I will list it here without going on through this. Um, basically, it's so, you, you may also see that we have something that looks like 
recursion here, <laughs> uh, but we'll get to that. Okay, so let's take a look at more complex example. Let's uh, imagine we have some data, stru data structure like user array, and we have filter function for that user. So uh, we want to create some kind of functions that will be filtering by certain properties. So um, the filter function takes data, it's going to be our user, it takes the attribute on which we will filter uh, the value of that attribute and the operator. So, for example, we say that on users, on users array, the attribute age should be greater than 30. Let's create that function current. So, what do we need? First of all, we need to create current filter function. So, we'll call in our curry function with this filter function. Basically, our function, our current filter can be executed with one argument per call. So uh, let's create it. And with the usage of that, we can create a lot of functions based on that without any copy pasting or anything like that. So for example, we want to create a function filter by edge. So we're calling, calling our color filter with our data. So sorry, it's users users and we're providing the second that here's the attribute so we're passing h here so basically this function only need to receive the value and the operator okay we can create function older than 30 for example and we're calling this filter by age 30 and here we need to have operator we need operator greater than. Okay, so we've created something like, I would say selector for our filter function. So let's take a look at our user's array. So we have John Doe that is more than 30 and Elizabeth, and basically that's all. Any other of them shouldn't be listed in that array. Okay, um, let's take a look. Yeah, the result is exactly what we expected. So it's filtered only by our filter value. And let's create another one like younger than 30, for example. And here is gonna be the same, or we will just create less than. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think should be listed on the chain because the Steven is 30 and we have this kind of parameter here. So let's take a look. Yeah, basically on the chain is locked here. So yeah, here was an example of, of Karin. Let's move on. Um, so we've talked about functional approaches, <clears throat> but we need to mention about not functional approaches. Um, so if you're using loops, uh, they're not functional, really. Um, what you, you should use instead, you should use uh, higher order functions like map or recursion. Um, letter or, yeah, you should use only const void functions. Uh, void function are considered functions that have side effects. So if you have some function that does something but does not return anything, it's going to be a function with side effects and it's not functional. Object mutation, um, we've talked about it already. You should not mutate object, only return a new copy of that. Uh, and also we have method that mutates arrays. While some functions like map, uh, they're, um, they're not mu mutating arrays, but we have some other function that mutates array. I would say for me, in my time, the most uh, interesting here was sort because I've already, we saw I don't know, for some reason that sort will return a new instant, a new array, but not really. It will modify the existing one. Okay. <clears throat> and we've covered like the basic uh, stuff that is going on in functional programming. Let's talk about more functional programming in React. Basically, I need to mention that React tends to be more functional over the years. You may see that firstly we had class components, but then we have functional components. And uh, some other approaches in React are pretty much functional. So I would say the React tends to be functional to be functional as well. 
So first of all, we have higher order components. Basically, it's our high order function, but only for components. Um, basically, it's a function that takes component as an argument and return a new component with additional functionality. Yeah, I think today they're not used as much as they were used before, but the concept is present, so we need to mention it. Um, Hooks can be used for a variety of reasons. They can add authentication, caching, data fetching, uh, logging. They can, like for some time ago, Redux was using only with high order components. Um, here is an example of the simple high order components. So basically, we receive a component, we're returning that component with the props that were passed in, and we're just adding some functionality. Here, we're just adding some console log that will make um, this co uh, component locked greeting just the same only with console lock and we can reuse it with some other components as well. Okay, um, pure components, pure components are like pure functions. So basically they return the same output given the same result. Uh, pure components can be optimized for performance re reasons because they can be mem memoized, uh, meaning that they are their output can be cached and reused when their input does not change. This is an easy one. Um, basically, it's our dummy components. This component only relying on the props and nothing else. If props does not change, the component also does not change. It does not have state, it's stateless. It does not depend on any external stuff. So this component we can call pure. Uh, immutability. Functional programming encourages immutability as we talked about earlier. Um, in React, this can be achieved by using state and props in the correct way. Um, basically, uh, if you know, we cannot modify its state like in this example, we cannot say count equals to we should only modify state with the usage of this set count function. And this is the great example of immutability in React. We cannot modify the props and we cannot directly modify the state. Um, and by the way, I think uh, you probably know what, what is it in the screen. Basically, it's the Redux flow. Uh, the Redux is a functional library in the sense that it promotes functional programming as well. Um, and it uses pure function to manage application state. Um, in Redux, the application store is um, stored in immutable object tree and updates the state trigger um, perform uh, trigger using only by pure functions. Um, this approach allows for predictable state management and makes it easier to reason about the behavior of the application. Um, in addition to re reducers, Redux also makes use of functional concepts like high order function and function composition to create middlewares and other abstractions. Okay, declarative programming. Um, well, functional programming encourages declarative programming or the idea that the program should be described what they do instead, how they do it. Um, this is actually the main uh, reason why we use React. React is, uses JSX under the hood. So the JSX by the definition is um, declarative. And if we're using any map, we're actually telling like, we need these props to do rendered uh, each one of them. So basically I would say the whole React is mostly declarative. Okay. Um, well, if you've got interested in functional programming, you should take a look at these uh, tools and libraries here. Uh, Ramda and Sanctuary are a little bit similar. Um, I would say they're similar to Ladash in some way. So they provide you type of uh, utils functions, uh, some types uh, that will help you to create more functional code. Also, by the way, these functions are usually coming carried, so you can partially call them. But if we're talking about fantasy land, fantasy land is a more advanced library and it's not a library, it's actually um, a documentation for alg algebraic structures that ja in JavaScript. So basically, if you go there, you can take a look. What does it, what does functor means? What does mod, monad means? What should it implement? Wh what interface should there be? So I would say it's a more bit of a complex concept, but if you're interested in it, it's going to be great. Okay. Um, functional programming has several benefits that makes it a popular approach to software development. And let's talk about that. 
Um, first of all, functional programming promotes modularity or the idea that the software should be built in small independent unit that can be easily combined to create larger systems. Um, this makes it easier to write, test and maintain software. Um, functional programming that we, we've already talked about, it encourages immutability or the idea that the data should not be changed. Uh, this helps to avoid bugs related to shared immutable state and then can make it easier to reason about complex systems. Uh, functional programming promotes functional composition. Um, the idea that the function can be co combined to create a new one, this can make it easier to create more reusable code and improve code organization. Um, functional programming makes it easier to test our function because of basically we're having only pure function and pure functions are really easy to test because they do not depend on any external state. And this can lead also to more maintainable and reliable software. Um, functional programming can lead to more concise code and expressive uh, as function can be used to express complex operation in a clear and concise way. This can improve code readability and reduce the chance of errors. Overall, functional programming can help developers write better software that is more reliable, maintainable and scalable. While it requires a little bit different way of thinking, the benefits of functional programming can make it worth the effort to at least try it. Okay, and we need to be honest, we need to mention why functional programming can be bad for you. Uh, while functional programming has many benefits, there are some drawbacks for sure. Uh, first of all, yeah, the learning curve. Functional programming can be more difficult to learn and master compared to imperative programming, which can make it less accessible to developers who are new to programming or who are more familiar with imperative programming paradigms. Um, some functional programming techniques, uh, such as recursion, uh, can lead to inefficient code use uh, or memory usage uh, if not used properly. I've also mentioned that. Um, additionally, functional programming can sometimes require more memory because we're using the immutability for sure, we're using more memory. Um, with the popularity of functional programming, um, it still has fewer tools and libraries compared to imperative programming. Uh, this can make it more difficult to find support and resources for specific more functional programming languages or frameworks. Um, while debugging can be easier, it also can be harder in functional programming because functions are often composed to other functions, making it more difficult to track the source of an error. Um, functional programming can also be a little bit hard uh, with readability because mm, use of higher order function and stuff like that may not be familiar to a lot of developers. Overall, uh, the functional programming is not necessarily bad, but it may not be the best choice for every situation or project. It requires a different mindset and skill set compared to imperative programming. So, and for sure, we need to mention that our, about our battle. So basically, um, a lot of people are arguing about what is better approach, object-oriented programming or functional programming, because these are two major programming paradigms. Um, while both used to solve problems in computer programming, uh, they have distinct approaches to problem solving. We've taken a look already at functional programming, but what about object-oriented programming? It is a paradigm that resol resolves around the use of objects, um, which are instances of classes. It focuses on encapsulating data and behavior within that object. Object communicate with each other. Uh, also, object-oriented programming emphasizes the usage of inheritance, polymorphism, which allow code reuse and abstractions. Um, in general, functional programming is often used for tasks that require complex data transformations and computations. And well, when object-oriented programming is often used for tasks that involve modeling uh, of real world objects and systems. Um, whether to use functional programming or object-oriented programmer in JavaScript really depends on your specific requirements of your projects, your personal preferences as a developer, 
and the developer's team experiencing um, expertise. So in practice, many modern JavaScript applications use a combination of both paradigms. So the choice between functional programming and object-oriented programming should be based on the specific needs of each exact project. So I would say if you have two, two approaches to have, uh, if you have two approaches for code solving, so why would you use the both of both worlds? Why don't you use the best of both worlds? <laughs> yeah, I think that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Tarja, we have one question in the chat. If you can look mm -hmm. at this. Okay, it will depend on browser locale settings, though. Um, you you mean the date? I I would say that uh, we will we was talking about the date and that it will depend on browser locale setting though. Um, I would say if we're talking about the UI, the UI is pretty much imperative, I agree. But if we're talking about the execution where we execute it, it will always return the same stuff here. But yeah, I am I agree that the dates are really tough to work with in a functional way. Yeah, it's true. There will be no errors, you are sure, uh, but uh, well, it's not the best approach and we're losing the benefits of React that um, provides us the component re-render by changing the state. Uh, okay, uh, FP also shines best when combining it with good type system, in this case TypeScript. I'm totally, I totally agree here because actually if you take a look at um, uh, the, the specification that I provided you, Fantasy Land, you will see that it uses uh, TypeScript uh, because there are interfaces that should be implemented and stuff like that. So yeah, I totally agree that um, functional programming with usage of TypeScript will be one of the safest options to write a software. <laughs> 